Hello everyone, welcome to another hardcore edition of ARG Presents. I am Amigo Aaron, joined by a man who some consider red and delicious, but I see it's yellow and soft. I give you the Brent. I consider myself green and sweet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sour is more That's, like all it. Alright, I'll give you that. Yeah, there. So, if you tuned in last week, we spun the wheel and we made the deal. Yes, with the devil. And this week, Brent, believe it or not, we will be playing games on the Apple Macintosh platform. Yes, I'm now, having talk with mm-hmm. Zeus about that. <laughs> so, what do you know about the Apple Macintosh, Brent? Yeah, very little, although I have had some experience with the old Macs. Um, my buddy's parents had Macintoshes that they used at work and they brought home, and we would play games on from that. Uh, but mm-hmm. I will have to say my... My general day-to-day use of them very, very limited. Very limited. I was pretty much the same. I knew. I, in fact, I, ironically, I own a Mac, but I never use it. It's right. a newer Mac, uh, but we're focusing on the old classic Macs of the yes. day. But let's learn a little bit about the Mac here. I, I did some research, pick up, pulled up some facts, and called some information. So, all right, the Macintosh, and of course, they changed. Now, get this. I didn't know this first out of the gate. They changed the Macintosh name to just the Mac. It's the Mac. In in '98, so no, it's true. Well, that's that's I you know I prefer Macintosh. It has more of a I don't know Mac. Well, yeah, you know what can you say? Anyways, they uh, the Apple has been selling these bad boys since January of 1984. Yeah, and if you look into the the history of the of the development of the Mac, uh, they really started working on it like '79. So it's been uh, research and worked on for for a long time. Sure. Uh, the original Mac uh, was the first mass-marketed personal computer that featured a GUI, graphical user mm-hmm. interface. Of course, they came in before uh, the Atari <laughs> ST and the, and the Amiga did in 84. Now, And they swear Xerox <clears throat> had nothing to do with well, it. Well, that's something I was going to say. Uh, uh, in 79, Steve Jobs, the jobber himself, the weird turtleneck freak, rolled into Xerox... And had a look at the Xerox Park P A R K, and he immediately started work on the on a yes. GUI interface. Yes. So you got to give the dude credit uh, because uh, he knew what he was doing in terms of well, picking up that GUI. He saw really more of the uh, potential than Xerox did. Sure. You know, it reminds me a little bit of Nolan Bushnell, right? Nolan Bushnell saw Pong. Yeah. He liked Pong, and he horked Pong. Yeah. yeah. Now and, and really. As much as uh, Nolan and and Steve, I, I, I have disdain for them in some regard. They you disdain are, Nolan. What yeah, did he a little do? bit. Well, he worked a bunch of stuff too. That was that was something he did. But these were powerful men that that did something that the other people didn't, and they really attacked it. And they had a a strong understanding of business. <clears throat> And they really took that that knowledge and made what they had work. Yeah, um, I will say as much that, as I hate it in a lot of cases. Mm. Uh, 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 the Apple operating system uh, is not licensed to anyone. Yeah. So uh, I think, with one small exception, it has always been an Apple only product. Mm-hmm. So you can, like Windows, you can't just put it on any PC, and which is an interesting route to go. Uh, <clears throat> it has kept them smaller, but they they run the, they run the show. Yeah. Um, now get this, I thought this was amusing, considering the way things turned out. At the time when they designed the Mac, it was designed to be a low cost, easy to use machine for the average consumer. <clears throat> <laughs> they kept some of that <laughs> because Macs. I just re- uh, read a release. There are no Macs available for under one thousand yeah. dollars now. Yeah, so that's, yeah, it's a lot of money. So the final design uh, for the uh, original Mac, uh, it had sixty four k of ROM, it had one hundred twenty eight k of RAM, which is interesting. It, it, you could put more RAM in it. It had a nine inch screen, monochrome screen. <clears throat> Not bad. Now uh, there were two. In Macintosh, not to get or in Apple, not to get too deep in this, there were sort of two competing uh, uh, or two simultaneous projects: the Macintosh project and the Lisa project, which was yes. very similar. 
And <clears throat> eventually, the jobber, Steve Jobs, got the boot from Lisa. Yeah. So he just <laughs> went and took over the Mac <laughs> and, and pretty much ran the show on that one. Uh, so and how often do you hear about the Lisa project anymore? Well, I mean, the, well, the emulators are something I've heard them called Lisa. It's like, it, it it all became the same thing yeah, eventually. Yeah, so it get this: the '84 debut. Now I got to touch on this. I got it. In '84, Apple hired uh, Ridley Scott. Ridley Ridley Scott, the famous director yeah. of Aliens and all these other movies. I knew where this was going. <laughs> he, they spent up one and a half million dollars in '84, by the way, and they produced the 1984 commercial. All right, it aired during Super Bowl. Uh, what is that? Uh, 18. No, I can't be right. Yeah, 18 uh, on January 22nd, 1984, <clears throat> and it was supposed to be. Uh, if they say. If this was a huge deal. Now, it was. I don't remember. Uh, well, I'll probably watch that Super Bowl almost certainly, but I don't remember this commercial. But I, of course, the commercial is now sort of infamous. Well, no, I mean, th- people consider this one of the greatest commercials of all time. Yeah. If you haven't seen the commercial, it's sort of in a dystopian 1984 area where uh, presumably the PC people are marched around like lemmings yeah. while this guy this guy on the screen t- talks to them, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. Very this, corporate type, like corporate overlord type right. setting. And then uh, all of a sudden this sort of bouncy uh, uh, chick comes rolling down the aisle with like a sledgehammer yep. in like a track suit looking, I mean, they picked her for a reason. She rolls up, she spins around, she throws the hammer at the the big, huge screen where the overseer over, screen, le- overlords yeah. at it, but hits it, you know, and it and this was considered, and this was the Apple commercial. Now the Simpsons parodied this, I believe. Everyone, has yeah, it, back know. at some point, but this was a huge commercial, and it was called uh, the most successful uh, ad of all time. Uh, the people that put it together said the ad was more successful than the Mac was. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, the and two days after that aired, okay, two days after the Super Bowl, the Mac went on sale, and it came with two uh two different applications. It had the Mac Mac Write and Mac Paint, which of course these were all Mac, everything was Mac Mac everything. Um, so and then eventually uh, Apple introduced uh Office an Office Suite, and then they produced another commercial. On this one you haven't seen that much. This is another one they spent a bunch of money on. And it was sort of famous. It was the Lemmings commercial. Now, it's not the game, Lemmings. This is a commercial where a bunch of people in business suits with briefcases are all marching in step together yeah. off a cliff. Yeah. Oh, they're blindfolded. Did I mention that? And so, uh, finally, one guy takes his blindfold off. He's the Mac guy. He's the guy. He's rebelling against society. He's not going to be a lemming. He just walks off the, the PC cliff. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I will say, I felt like the lemmings a few times. God, there's no choice. You've got to march in, in lockstep as you walk off the cliff. Uh, this ad didn't do as well. <laughs> but, I mean, it was still, I, I remember the ad. Uh, I mean, it didn't have nearly the audience that the first one did either. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, th- they brought in a CEO and he came in and the first thing he did was raise the price of the Mac. So, he raised it from at two thousand bucks to twenty five hundred bucks. Holy Same Mac, moly. but the it, it, the thing sold pretty well. And by, in April of eighty four, the company had sold fifty thousand Macs, and they'd hoped to sell seventy thousand by May. And so they did okay. They did okay. Well, that's actually yeah, that's pretty they, good for that kind of money. Uh, the problem after back then. after a year though, here's the bad downside: the Mac had less than a quarter of the PC software selection. And Apple had sold a 280,000 Macs, but IBM uh, and IBM had only sold 100,000 PCs at the time. So it looked pretty good. But then eventually, eh, everything caught up. You know Plus what? You, this is and you're, this, some of this stuff takes place during like this is where the, for the PC really took off, and also the uh, you had the PC Junior around this time and uh, stuff. There was a lot of confusion in the market. Speaking of an ad campaign, remember that one? The ad campaign for uh, the PC Junior. I do not. With the little tramp walking around and the no doesn't ring a bell. Well, that's, no. there's a reason, but you do remember the <laughs> Mac ones, right? Yes, I so do. both of them. So there you go. Um. Anyway, the gaming uh on this thing was n- negligible at this point. Oh sure. Right. However, uh, 
the only third party developer for the Mac you're gonna love is who is always developing for everything all the time. Like nothing stops them. Atari? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. There's one name that you I don't care what computer you've got, they're always there. It's Infocom. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> always there, and info. A lot of people had trouble getting used to the programming on a Mac because of all right. the wacky. Oh yeah, it was know. it was different. It was very different. So Infocom did what they always did. They wrote their own operating system and they put their games on. <laughs> it worked fine. So that but so that there were Infocom games back back in the day. Um. So, uh, not to dwell too long on the Mac in terms of a computer, but it's kind of interesting to see the how it progressed. So. They realized that they needed more memory in this thing, so eventually in October they re- they released a, a, a 512k Mac, which was uh, needed because they, 128 was you know kind of low for for a graphical user interface. Uh, they released a Mac Plus January of '86. How much you figure that thing cost in January '86? We'll take a guess. I'm going to say 28. Close. You're very close. 26. Yeah. It offered a meg of RAM, and you could expand it to four megs. It also had a SCSI parallel interface, and so which you know you could put hard drive in it. I think it had. To, I think it was an external one. Now uh, the Mac Plus was a very popular computer, and it did not get messed with for like four years until October of ninety. Mm. <laughs> so it, it was a. Wow. It was. It did a very. It, that was one of the more popular Macs. Uh, <clears throat> so the Mac Two uh, came out, and it was the first uh, Mac with color graphics. Yes. Right. Yep. So in in it, it of course among other things they had more upgrades than just that, but it was a pretty big deal. The Mac Two, they introduced the Mac Two, and it was fifty five hundred bucks. Wow. Wow. It had a and it had a sixty eight twenty in it, just like the uh, Amiga twelve hundred does. All right. So same. I mean the price difference there is uh, uh, way off the Incredible. charts. Incredible. And then uh, the Mac SE was released right about the same time that the Mac Two was, and it was it was twenty nine hundred dollars, but without a hard drive. Uh, of course, you know back then the hard drive wasn't as important as it is now. Oh no, absolutely not! You can just do everything off floor. Now here, I had to include this. Uh, in eighty eight, uh, Apple sued Microsoft <laughs> and Hewlett Packard on the grounds that they infringed on Apple's copyrighted GUI, citing the use of the rectangular overlapping and resizable windows. Uh, so keep in mind, Apple <laughs> gripped at this from Xerox. Um, anyway, they tossed that case. Yeah. yeah that... <laughs> Think about that. That was 88. I mean, that was well in the windows by that sure, point. Sure, sure. And then uh, the last thing I'm going to cover, since it's in the realm of the get time period our games were released, uh, the, uh, they finally, in 88, uh, they released the Mac 2X. Which had the Motorola 6830 processor, which again is featured in a lot of Amigas, and <clears throat> had an MMU. So at this point, you, you're you're piling on the power uh, from, oh, from yeah. the earlier yeah. Max. Yeah. Still. And you <clears throat> had to because everything was getting more powerful. Now, one thing there was not a. Um, I looked through a lot of the Mac software to see when I was trying to pick a game for this week's episode, and there was there was some. Because I knew I wanted something monochrome, and right. we talked about that. Right. And uh, there was some, uh, but there was not a, a like a huge ton of it of, of what I would call quality commercial games. You know what I found? There were lots of religious software, really and religious games, and educational games. Hmm, makes sense. I mean, there. I almost picked a piece of religious software a game religious game because there was just such a vast library mm, of it. Mm, very interesting very interesting but i didn't so <laughs> with that brief history of the mac in mind uh, we were tasked to 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 choose two games from the mac library and again we we wanted to uh, uh, limit ourselves to the to the monochrome mac didn't we, we it's, yeah you know the older stuff very classic type software yeah because you know we had looked at uh when we did the apple and we ended up doing uh wolfenstein what was the other game we did on the apple the one that you picked i can't remember the uh sword um oh it was the uh yeah for was it the fogel or whatever yes. yeah um, Fogor. um those games were fun and they were simple games and i was kind of like hoping we could kind of get some of that action because that's what the apple was sort of known for this kind of game simple yeah. but complex and i think we Picked a couple of interesting games. So, Brent, why don't you lead the show this lit week? Tell us about what you what you had chose. I chose the incredibly loved 
Crystal Quest. Okay. And before we can talk about Crystal Quest, we have to step back one step and talk about Crystal Raider, which was actually the game that came out before Crystal Quest. Crystal Raider had very much the same premise. It was a shareware game. And it was, you were in a ship flying around collecting crystals. Uh, you could shoot, you were in a one, one uh, static screen environment. You collected all the crystals in a, in a space realm and went through an exit at the bottom of the screen. You had two enemy generators on either side that would generate enemies, uh, six types, and that was the game. It was way more standard of a game, though, because it was move in eight directions, fire in eight, you know, fire whichever way you're flying, a very uh, basic, especially for the time, very basic game. Um, and then Patrick Buckland stepped up and said, you know, we've got this game, Crystal Raider, pretty interesting game. And at this time, uh, Buckland is... <clears throat> certainly not new to the scene, uh, but a lot, this is when computers were really accelerating and new and fascinating things were coming out. So he looked at, at, at Crystal uh, Raider and said, you know what, I'm going to modify this. I'm going to rewrite some of this because I have always see my buddies playing around with the Mac paint and that kind of stuff, and they're just whipping the mouse back and forth and just like erasing pictures with the, with the erase tool. And they're having fun just using the mouse because it, it kind of had that acceleration property on it. And from that, he implemented those type of controls into Crystal Quest. So Crystal Quest is almost exactly visually like Crystal Raider, except it has mouse controls that accelerate with your acceleration of the mouse. You accelerate your ships and your shots. And before I get really into Crystal Quest, I want to mention uh, Crystal Crazy, which was the sequel to Crystal Quest that added in more game elements, Was uh, um, had more things to do. It had where you would uh, uh, smash objects just by flying into them with velocity. It would have where you would uh, uh, collect pool balls in the right order. It was still in that space setting. You still had the same type of enemies. You still had crystals to collect, but you, then you went through an exit. All that was still there, but it had more elements of the game. Mm. So I think that's really when it got accelerated, but that wasn't what was famous. What's famous is Crystal Quest, and the reason why it's famous is implementing those mouse movements and techniques. So let's go a little bit into Crystal Quest and what it is and what it isn't. Uh, like I said before, it's set in a space environment, one static black screen. Your enemies come out from the left to right. You are a ship that can fire in any direction that you're moving, and you are only limited by the movement of your mouse. It had, I mean, it was infinitely directional. So, enemies pop out, you're trying to collect crystals, and it was all about speed and precision with mouse movement which was not done at this time. Any time a mouse was implemented in games in this era, because a mouse was very new uh, back in 1987. You know, uh, yeah. some people had never even used a mouse because you didn't have to. I remember the first time I saw one, I thought it rode on a cushion of air. <laughs> <laughs> the computer store, I was like, what is this? So, yeah. So, yeah I understand. So, to take a mouse, and, and people who were using the mouse in the game was point-and-click adventures, which, you know, became a, t a whole thing. But this, uh, uh, Buckland said, you know what, I'm going to take this mouse and I'm going to make it the primary input device for an entire game. And that's what he did. Uh, you use the mouse button to fire. The only keyboard input you have is uh, smart bombs that clear off all the enemies on the screen with a space bar. But it was something that was very revolutionary at the time to have your, your <coughs> ship move at the speed of, of your mouse movement. And the game was ported all over the place after this. Really? Uh, and, and what's kind of crazy is uh, uh, Crystal Quest is what got all the ports. Uh, it got ported to uh, the Apple II. It got ported to the Amiga. 
Yeah, that surprised me. Um, I had not played it. It got ported to the Game Boy, which makes almost no sense because it had the... I mean, the whole thing was its controls, but I guess at that point, the name was famous. Mm -hmm. So you could get it ported off that. Apple II got a port. The Xbox 360 Arcade got a a version of this. And it actually used uh, two types of control. It had Robotron controls where... Uh, move with one stick, fire in a different direction, and, or classic controls. So it actually implemented both. Let me ask you a question real quick. Sure. H- had you, since this got ported to everything, <laughs> yes. and, and, and I have a similar tale with mine, had you ever heard of this game until this week? Nope. Okay. <laughs> it had all these ports, and it's supposed to be famous, and I was around in 87. I know I never heard of this game. Yeah. No, no I didn't. I, I And I don't know if it was just because... It was more of a Mac crowd thing, and I where I didn't have access to a Mac. Right. You know, I didn't keep up with Mac games. Um, yeah, when I flipped to my magazines, uh, well, I didn't even Macs weren't even mentioned in the magazines I were getting at the time. Right, right, so, right, right. Uh, but yeah, this also got ports to to you know your iOS, your Androids. The Palm got a, pi- a port of this game. You played with the you I played guess with, with the, the stylus. Yeah, yeah I, I I didn't look into it. That makes sense, I guess. Uh, sort of. It'd be of? a little. It'd be hard to work that in, <laughs> that inertia or everything over with it. But uh, so when you've got a game that this that is this popular, and it won a bunch of awards as well. Uh, before getting you know all the ports back in '87 when it won a bunch of its awards. So what do games like this that are really famous for the time? What do they do? They come back as Kickstarters. And Crystal, Did another one of yours? Crystal <laughs> Quest uh, started a Kickstarter back in, I believe it was 2015, early 2015. Oh. And they wanted to release Crystal Quest Classic, which would have been an updated graphical version. They wanted to release it for the consoles. They wanted to release it for, on Steam, uh, on the Mac stores, all these things. And they asked for thirty thousand dollars. Reasonable. And it failed horribly. Oh, how, uh, only they... receiving uh, less than forty five hundred dollars towards its goal. But that's a pretty reasonable goal. To it, thirty it, grand. Yeah, thirty grand is pretty reasonable. But you know what? Uh, Patrick Butlin, <coughs> Buckland, and uh, well, his buddy was going to be doing the programming for all these modern consoles and stuff. Uh, John, I'm sorry, I'm going to put you your last name. Ostrazi, mm-hmm. uh, they both cool name. said, you know what? Yeah, yeah I thought <clears throat> I pronounced it right. Uh, they said, you know what? It failed on Kickstarter, but we're still going to do it. All right. And they did. And you, this is now available. Uh, the Crystal Quest Classic is available on Steam. They went through the Greenlight program and got it, put it on there. <clears throat> they uh, went through the Xbox Live program, and that's how it's on the 360, uh, is as uh, Crystal Quest Classic. So... They didn't let the, the 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 failure of the Kickstarter campaign stop them from doing what they thought would make money. I wonder how they did. Uh, I would say they did okay <clears throat> because it's still up on Steam, and they were selling the game for a reasonable price. They were asking five dollars. You know, five so, bucks. So if this was something you grew up with as a kid, and you said, you know what? For five bucks, I will I will bring back some of that nostalgia. I think that's very reasonable. Mm. And you know, since Patrick Buckland was involved in some of these ports and gave his blessing, he got some of that money too. So you know, I like that win win. In my opinion, a real success story, <clears throat> even though the uh, campaign itself did not go off well. Mm. So something else that really sold. Uh, Crystal Quest was its critter editor. Did you play with that at all? I did not. I mean, in fact, I wasn't even aware of that. <clears throat> yes. You could actually... It was a program that came with your Crystal Quest game. You could edit every single aspect of the game. You could change the sprites. And and some of the sprite stuff was very uh, 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 involved. I mean, to the point where you could change... Uh, some of the animations, the colors, what the sprites actually were. I mean, draw completely new sprites. Did it have its own editor? Did you use that Mac paint? No, it had its own editor. Hmm. And uh, you could change how the enemies, if they were, how aggressive they were, how fast they moved, 
how much uh, energy, how much life they had. Um, and this was in the original version. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hmm. Yes. Pretty good. Oh, I didn't. Know, I wasn't aware of that. When it, it, his publisher, he, he kind of mm. sent that along with it, and his pub, their publisher saw saw this was going to be a big deal. Mm-hmm. So they said, you know what, uh, Patrick, let's let's refine this. Let's get this ready. Let's ship it with it. And he credits a lot of the success of the game to the creditor editor that came with it. Because you could, like I said, you could basically make your own game, or at least the, the, the skin of your own game, uh, with your own rules and your own feel inside the game that came with it. You know, you saw that more back in the day. I was just looking through some uh, for the Amigos this month. We're playing a lot of the old stuff we got sent. Mm-hmm. Someone sent us, I believe it was O'Brien's Retrocade, sent us a game called, and I'd never heard of this, it was called uh, Marble Madness Construction Set. Have you ever heard of this? Marble Madness You know, Marble Madness, the arcade yeah. machine. This lets you make your own... There were games in the day where you could make your... That was a thing, making your own levels or editing stuff. And I I like that. I can see... You can see the appeal of it, certainly. Absolutely. Well, look at some of the most famous games of all times right now (sighs) is uh, uh, Minecraft. And that... Sure, That whole thing is just about, you know, exploring and editing your world. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, another thing they did that made Crystal Quest very famous (sighs) was it is the first... Color Mac game. Mm. Now I focus more on uh, the monochrome version. I didn't play. I, the, I didn't play the color version. Uh, but the it they we saw the color screen and they said, you know what, we can do something with that, and they ported the game to the color screen. Mm-hmm. And when you bought the game, you could actually you've got both versions. Hmm. Uh, you know, down the line. Uh, so how did I feel about Crystal Quest? Um. You want to try to explain? Everybody explain what the game is. Sure, it's a it's a run. It's a shoot, collect crystals, shoot. You get the your movement with the mouse. I did. You were just off and lost. Well, I mean, it's sort of like it, there's not a whole lot to it. No, you, it's a very simple. The you, premise the, of the, the game the, is very simple. Much like saying asteroids, the 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 meat of the game lies in the control scheme. Yes. Oh no, that's exactly what it and, is. And and you're not trying. You're trying to not hit people, and you're trying not to hit obstacles, and you're trying to get out and catch all the stuff. Uh, and the control scheme. Well, what, go ahead. What did you think about this thing in terms of playing it? I'll... I did not like it. I and I was playing. I, I played this on a, on. Uh, a Java emulator, and I thought it felt weird, not mis-emulated, just the acceleration felt weird, and I think some of that has to do with using a laser mouse over a ball mouse, um, because it, it was the movements were very fine, and I watched some videos of people playing uh, in a more classic environment. And I felt like they had more control, even with the older mouse technology, than I had using a laser mouse. Um, I felt like the, my movements, even a slight movement, it wasn't that I, I couldn't move slow around the map because I could. It's just all my movements had to be so subtle um, that it, it, it felt off. So I don't feel as if I could really give this game a fair shake unless I played it with a ball mouse but for me the concept in general was kind of dry you gotta look at the era I do I understand that this, this is a, I understand and, that now I'll, I'll play this on two different emulators we don't have a, a Mac Classic the funny thing is I think Boat's got one I should have talked to him about it but um, I played it on the on the web-based emulator, then also just downloaded an emulator and played it. I could tell a difference. I'll tell you that right now between the web-based and the and the PC emu- straight-up emulator. Well, those job emulators, you've got to have a pretty beefy system. All right. Well, I do, uh, and, but it just it, it didn't run. It it the, the control was felt a little funkier. Sure. Uh, that might say the control's funky, y'all. I, I, yes. <clears throat> yeah. uh, you build up. Momentum. I, I don't know how to. I, I, it's very unusual. 
I mean, yeah, I've never, I've never put anything to control with like this ever. Nothing. No. Uh, and so the control was not good for me. And what happened to me inevitably was I could start out collect because I mean you move the ship around like a cursor, like a mouse Sorta. cursor. Sorta. But uh, if your mouse cursor gained momentum in a certain direction or 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 went it went the exact speed of the movement of your mouse, that makes sense. It's it's hard to explain until you play it. But what inevitably what would happen would be uh, when you're playing when you're getting these uh, diamonds uh, or these uh, crystals, I should say. There are two obstacles on either side of the screen. There's an obstacle at the bottom, and then there's ships that are coming out yeah. and shooting. And inevitably, what would happen to me would be I would get going so fast that I would hit one of the obstacles or or hit a ship. Uh, you can shoot the ships, but I, shooting is real funky to get the. You have to you basically it shoots in the direction that your ship is going, as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah. That's and exactly so how it is. you have to sort of go towards your the, the people you want to shoot at. Which is not necessarily inducive to not getting killed. When you clear all the uh, diamonds or the crystals off the screen, a, the a trap door opens that you can leave. Right. You can't hit the sides of this thing. No, that, that was, was the number one way I died. Okay, that was very difficult. So what I found myself doing is I'd be like whipping around the screen like a maniac, and then I'd clear all those diamonds, and all of a sudden I'd be like moving the mouse, <laughs> you know, like like this, uh, trying to get through that stupid hole. I don't know. You might be on to something with the modern mouse, uh, or I'm not sure. For me, the control, I wanted to throw the thing off, off a cliff, just like the Lemmings guys, because it was so hard. And and the thing is, this the game is not super-duper complex. No. And I couldn't get far enough into it to see if it got really crazy. Uh, I watched some video of people playing it. It didn't seem like it got that much different. Uh, more. <gasps> in the, in the, the, the waves that you go through are random. How many enemies are gener generated or random? What enemies come out are static? Because you have to get so far before you get to the harder enemies. And there are a lot of enemies. There's like 12 different types of enemies you can face that all have kind of their own personalities. But uh, sometimes I would play, and I could get all the crystals and leave, never see an enemy, maybe see one enemy. And then I'd play the, again, same level, level one, and it would just flood the screen. So, you know, I I don't like that type of uh, advancement, if if you can call it advancement. I, I, I prefer at least your first three or four levels to have enough learning curve that you can kind of get comfortable. Um, how far did you get in this? Not you far. Know? I mean, how many waves did you get through? I think the best idea was I got to, like, the fourth wave. Okay, I got to about six or seven. Uh but it was only through a lot of pain. For me, it was just a miracle. You get a, you get a lot of lives uh, in the beginning. It, as long as you don't die immediately, uh, use, you get smart bombs, use them a lot. Yeah, because, that's how I got there, because I had to use the crap out of them. Well, I mean, and it's the game in the very beginning especially is pretty generous about giving them to you. If you get uh, the crystals that come out, or, or the diamonds that come out that give big score, as long as you collect them and don't shoot them, uh, can give you, you know, you, you can pick one of those up and get an extra man just off the points if you get lucky enough. So if you get lucky and get a lot of points in the beginning to rack up enough lives, you can get farther. But it takes playing it several times to get that kind of good luck. I think if you were good at this game, you could make it far every time. But if what? you're... What a statement. Well, no, but if you're... <laughs> if it, you're bad at it, you won't get as far. No, if you're bad at the game, you can still get lucky and get pretty far. If you get enough crystal picks up, pickups, if enough uh, smart bombs spawn, because it's all random, you can still get pretty far. Someone who's good is going to get very far every time. Someone who's bad can still have good luck and get pretty far. I want to hear you talk about the sound in the game. I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Although you know, at the every time you exit the level, uh, you hear a little "ooh," right? Yes. That is after a Patrick Butlin himself making that noise. Disturbing and uh, disturbing because uh, it sounds like a sexy girl noise. It does, yes. And and and, and Patrick is not a sexy girl. No, um, that's no good. The Xbox version actually made him change that. A they, wise choice. They said, you know, we can't have that. But, uh, I, I mean, that didn't bother me. 
I, really, the sound... It bothers of, me more now than it did. <laughs> none of the sound was... It was neither uh, memorable or distracting to me, to be completely That sounds honest. the one that I... <laughs> uh, when I finished the first level, I was like, the hell? What the yeah. heck was that? So, uh, and Patrick Buckland, it, Buckland is, is a character, uh, to say the least. Uh, he has many many names under his belt that he either developed or programmed for. Um, just to touch on a few that you and I have personal uh, relationships with, Carmageddon. Oh, that is an outstanding one. Uh, he also did uh, worked on State of Emergency for the PlayStation 2. I've heard of that, yeah. Uh, Pocket Bike Racer uh, for the 360. Uh, of course, he did a lot of... Um, XBLA uh, conversions, worked on Tempest, Warlords, Battlezone, uh, Atari Classics. He also worked on Magic the Gathering, Duels of the Planewalker. I remember that. Um, you played that, didn't you? And, of course, <clears throat> the Carmageddon uh, Recarnation. Oh, he, yeah? He, he did that as well. Um, I've been meaning I'm to get sure that a most people will... will See uh, the Crystal Quest is his most famous work. No, uh, no, but more than Carmageddon. Carmageddon is, is certainly uh, a game we played and enjoyed yeah. immensely, especially Carmageddon Two. That was the best. So, <clears throat> yeah, pretty interesting game. Pretty interesting history. Um, just real quick, stepping back onto the sequel of this, Crystal Crazy. Uh, if you haven't played that, it did not get the, the same kind of fanfare, I guess because the controls were kind of a copy, but the game was very updated from Crystal Quest. I like it. I think it's worth giving it. If you're not going to, if you're going to look at any of them, look at that you one. You like it's that one more, more? It's got more going on. It's a little more player friendly. It's well, got, what was that one released on? Is that the same thing? Just yeah, everything? Yeah. yeah, it was released, uh, well... It was released a little way later in '93. Right, right. I so. figured that. Yeah, I uh, I can only say that I didn't like it. I, I did not think the controls worked for me. If you've ever played uh, a game called Dragonfire uh, on the uh, old, it was on everything, the Atari 2600 and the Intellivision. The second scene where you run around collecting stuff while the dragon tries to shoot at you. It sort of kind of reminded me of that a little bit, but Dragonfire it had two screens, man. <laughs> yeah, there's well, a reason for it. Uh, uh, the, this just didn't... Ha I mean, again, I didn't get as far. Maybe if you get further, it'd be more interesting. But again, you've got to look at this stuff in the vacuum of when it was put to, put out. Yes. And and on the in this particular case, what, you know, you've got a thing that wasn't getting a lot of uh, top quality games. So. Yeah. And, and I think this... Uh, it... If you didn't like the graphics, change them. You know, if you didn't if you didn't like the difficulty, change it. You could go in and the editor and change it. Uh, I'm I'm going to do a rare thing. I'm going to give this game a pass based solely off of I don't feel like I can play it the way it was meant to be played because of the modern mouse technology, because of the limitations through emulation. Uh, I see where this game would be very enjoyable if you grew up with it but trying to get into it with a just a couple hours of play I, I, I wasn't able to get there with that said let's move on to your game did you do an ebay on this one? Oh yes i did the prices are kind of crazy uh for the old macintosh version <laughs> uh, you're looking at uh around 80 bucks yeah, I'm not surprised given the pedigree of the Mac and what you people are crazy about it. So, and uh, you, I, some one other thing to mention: uh, Patrick Buckland is still doing games. He has his own company, you know, so he's still in the biz, which I I love to hear. I love to hear. Yeah, that's like great. That. That's really good. So this week, I looked around. Same thing I do every time I pick one of these games for a system. I don't know. And I know zilch about Macintosh games. I mean, I, this is what it says, but I have no idea. A lot like, say, the Wonder Swan or something. It's just like, they're just wandering in the darkness. So I do what I always do, default to the game with the coolest name and the most awesome looking <laughs> screen. And so I chose 
And it's my game this week. A game, it's, I've never heard of this game, much like the other one. And everyone else knows about it, apparently. It's a game called Dark Castle. Yes. It was developed by some guys called Silicon Beach Software. And that's a whole other story, which I'll get into. Uh, and it, the, uh, it was released on the Mac. And then it, they went crazy and released it everywhere. So get yes. this. This has got the most diverse release I've ever seen of a game. So you've got uh, the Apple II and GS, okay? And the Amiga, the Atari ST, DOS. C64, all right? Uh, it got multiple releases on multiple machines. The, it came out on the freaking Genesis, the MSX, right? It came out on the CDI, okay? It came out on the C... The CDI got a copy of this game. Now, that's something. Uh, and these, these were all later releases after the 86 uh, Mac release. So this is a pretty early title. The machine had been only a few years when this sure. came out. Um. So, let's talk, just before I get into the game, I want to talk a little bit about early Mac development, game development, and, and how uh, this uh, Silicon Beach outfit came together. So, okay. the outfit was founded by this guy, and I found a really great article in, uh, about this. It was really interesting. So, it was founded by a guy named Charlie Jackson, okay? <clears throat> and this guy uh, basically had aspirations to, be, uh, to go to the Olympics, okay? So... He was like looking for, uh, he wanted to find a foothold to basically uh, uh, do while he did that. He wanted to find something to make some bucks. And so he saw that the that, that Mac was coming out and it was going to be a big deal. So he he basically went to San Diego and he, and he had a user. He said, listen, listen we're going to have a, a Mac users meeting. He does, he, and it was in his house. Okay. So he, and he, and he said, come on, you know, everybody come on down. Okay. So, he had all these people show up. It's a user's meeting. If you've ever been to a user's meeting, uh, you basically, you go and hang out, and you talk about the Mac, and you, and you swap yeah. code, yeah. And, you know, all that, sure. all that junk. So, he has all these people over, and he, he says, hey, does anybody program? You know, and he finds a couple guys, okay? Uh, he finds uh, Mark Stephan Pierce. And he finds Jonathan Gay, whose dad was at the meeting, not the kid, the dad. And so when he asked, "Hey, does anybody do this stuff?" Gay, uh, Jonathan Gay's dad said, "Yeah, my son is like won a programming award. Oh, he's in." Yeah. This, this other guy piped up. He, he he's like, "I I want some of that. I'm in." So he ended up culling together like a, a a team. Then they saw a guy who was a real graphic stud, right? And uh, this is the Pierce fellow I was talking about. And they find and they got him in. So they've culled together this little outfit. Okay, so what do they do? They start making they make a couple games, and eventually they were the ones that worked this out with the uh, um, Dark Castle. So this game literally was it was a grassroots public. Awesome. I mean, a designer, you know, uh, with with uh, uh, this guy Charlie Jackson, kind of the overseer of these guys. Because one thing about Charlie, he don't know how to program, you know. But he's but he's the classic. You know, the, you know, he's the classic guy that was the brains of the outfit. It's sure. just something you see time and time again. Sure. So, amongst the other things that they did as they were working on these games is they were like, there was a, they found this, uh, they were looking at ways to have better sound on the Mac. And one of the guys basically was like, you know, I'm looking through the Mac here, and it can do this basically digitized sound, but like nobody's doing it. Let's do it. And they did. And it worked. And people were like, how did you do that? You know? And, and, and it's funny because you look at this game, it says it, it has real sound. Yes, yeah. Now, it's a, a, a precursor for the real sound we would hear on the P, you know, the, the other outfit. I don't know if that, I doubt they're related. I couldn't find a connection. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I, it was, I thought that was interesting. Uh, so, uh, it was this, this particular game was designed and illustrated by Mark Pierce and programmed by Jonathan Gay. Again, that was that dude's dad. So think about it. This this game was programmed by a guy whose dad showed up at this user's meeting yes. and said, my kid's a real ace. Random happenstance. And it's the darndest thing. So what is Dark Castle? Uh, in a nutshell, Dark Castle is a uh, platform adventure game. Yeah. Uh, where you control a young hero named Duncan. Now, I looked... They don't ever say in the game that your name is Duncan. And I read that 
he was named in the second game. Okay, that was, this game had a sequel by the same sure. people. But I also read that somewhere in the documentation, I mean, the first game he was named Duncan. So your mileage may vary because I don't have, I don't actually physically own the game. So, but you control Duncan as he tries to uh, basically take out the Black Knight. Okay, and no easy task, by the way, to take this sucker out. Um, the game has fifteen levels. So when you start, when you start, the first thing you see when this game starts is a beautiful rendition. It's all monochrome. It's beautifully drawn rendition of a castle, the moon, and 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 and, uh, and, and a little like a like a like a lake or stream. And it's it's yeah, moving. Boat. Yeah, it's moving, and there's lightning crashing, and the sound. I will say on the on the Mac is a very uh, distinct. It's unusual. I mean, yes. it has much like your game. That anytime you hear this sound, it's very unusual. Yeah. Uh, they just, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like a frequency thing or a, a square wave versus you know whatever. But I mean, it's it has an odd tone to it, it and it's, it's very cutting. I mean, it cuts through yeah. the silence. It's it does. just noise. Yep. Um. So, but again, they used the technology they'd figured out to to have this cool sound. So this right away, you know, okay, I'm in for something. This is really attractive uh, uh, opening screen. I mean, one of the best I've ever seen. And in all honesty, it was gorgeous. It is. It's it a gets really you good fired up to go into this castle. And the very first castle screen yeah. is even better. So and then you open the. We start when you start the game. You you're basically staying at this area where you can go through a bunch of doors. All right, I believe it's one, two, three, four, five, like five doors. Well, yeah, and you can only go through four of them. Right. Yeah. And one of them's a big, huge door to mother. You're in a castle. Yeah. I cannot stress to you the, how incredibly impressive this screen is. Yes. Sharp as a knife. Uh, the Beautifully done. Some of the best uh, straight-up monochrome graphics I've ever seen. It, it's, not, it's not a monochrome game scene. It's monochrome art. Uh-huh. It, it is that it is that spectacular. It's incredibly impressive. It is, and the guy who could pull it off was a real talent. Yes, obviously. So you basically get to pick, choose your your poison in this game, and you pick one of these doors, and whichever door you pick will lead you to see your first scene. Now these scenes uh, are varied. Sometimes you're dodging birds in an attempt to climb up and, and dodge a dragon. Is a scene. One scene. You're going downstairs. You're trying to avoid rats and bats. There's a scene where a guy is rolling barrels at you. Very Donkey Kong. We're Donkey yeah. Kong. Uh, there are scenes where you are up on a roof, uh, avoiding lightning bolts. Yep. The thing about this game, this game is a real mixed bag, and I'll explain why. Every single scene in this game is beautifully rendered, beautifully done, high gloss video game here. Mm-hmm. They took their time and they did art. I mean, they're all beautiful. And they're and to a certain degree they're functional. Okay, now they all have interesting sound. Now, uh, one thing you learn from this game and of course this is the very beginnings of this sort of sound in games. And what you learn is and we learned it from Brent's game too, it's because you have the ability to have digitized sound, that does not necessarily mean your game's going to sound good. This game sounds quite stupid at times oh, because yes. the the no the noises it sounds like they much like Brent they just had the team just generate a bunch of these noises so you hear a bunch of stuff like like here's a bird coming now what's a bird sound like Brent eep eep bam it's in the game you know what's a rat sound like cheap cheap that's in the game you know it's like Tommy Wiseau they just get, they they literally would just say like okay here are the birds make a bird noise boop boop. And that's what the bird sounds like. This is some guy making a the noise. They didn't go digitize a bird, you know, or whatever. That's the noise. Uh, the the noises that the, it almost reminds me of the little grunts and groans that Dirk the Daring makes sometimes in, in Dragon's wow. Lair. You know, hoop, 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 hoop. all these weird noises. I mean, this is one of the strangest sounding games of all time. You, to a fault. Yeah, it's not. It's 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 actually sort of endearing in a way, but it's also. Absolutely annoying. Since we're talking about the sound, I, I was playing this and my my wife was sitting nearby, and she was like, "That is really annoying." Yeah. And it was the it was the sound of the mice, and there were so many of them on the screen at the same time that it was just continuous 
high pitched squeal over and over and over and over. It was horrible. I eventually muted the sound on this game. Yes, and thank- it was that bad. Yeah, you thankfully you can. Uh, well, I just do something about the sound. Yeah, it was. Oh my gosh. So, so but don't. And the thing is, people are like, "You're killing the sound." This is a classic game. The sound is irritating, grating, but it's impressive that it's there. So, I mean, it's a mixed bag, right? So, as we mentioned, the game has like 14 levels. It also has a crap load of enemies. So, get this, and I, I saw every one of these at some point, whether I saw it or I watched the playthrough. You got your bats, you got to have those. You got your rats, vulture, mutants, burning eyes, which are sort of like uh, the holders. Like sort of, yeah. Uh, the uh, Brooms. Just some guards, henchmen that throw rocks, a guy with a whip, remember him? A dragon, a gargoyle. Pretty pretty, pretty good uh, bunch. And the Black Knight himself. And the Black Knight himself, yeah. Uh, there's a couple places in the game where, well, there's actually some real annoying parts of the game. Here's another thing that happens. There's this room that's like a dungeon, mm-hmm. okay? If you fall through certain holes in the screen, or occasionally a, this creature will come and pick you up, and you're deposited in this dungeon. You've got to get out of here. Yep. And at the bottom of the dungeon, there's a guy whipping three dudes. <laughs> and there's that's also where you get some keys down there. Yep. Uh, so th- there's a lot of tedium involved in the game. A lot of tedium. Uh, the controls are real tough. Let's go with that. This uses the, the keyboard for movement, W-A- uh, WSAD, you know, the standard stuff. And you, and you can use those to uh, move around, but the real, and that's okay. I mean, you can get by with that. Oh, sure. The real trouble comes for, for when you get to this, these other controls here, because we're not done. So, in this game, uh, picking up rocks is vital. Yes. Because this is... Sacks for, of rocks. For a while, rocks are your only weapon. For the majority of the game, the rocks right. are the, your primary Eventually, weapon. you can, you will get a, uh, uh, you can earn a fireball, which right. is much better, but rocks are your main weapon. So when you there the uh, this thing has you use an action button to get the rocks and um, do, among other things also you need to do it to uh, do switches hold the shield stuff yeah, like it's that a, it's an all all and it's Q so p- yeah. picture of keyboard in your in your head now you've got Q in the mix now let's say you want a duck right that's a button that's a, much like the defend- this is the defender of classic gaming that's not defender you hit E to duck okay then your space bar does your jump. Okay. Now you can uh, 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 you can jump higher or lower depending, but you can yeah. that's just that's how you jump. Tap, and you can also use jump. spacebar in conjunction with other keys to like running, jump, and yes. swing. Now, so keep that. How many keys is that? What six, seven, eight keys? And we're not done. So let's say you want to throw a rock. All right. Well, this you go to the mouse. So the mouse lets you aim your arm like this. Eight directions. All right. Here I go. And so let's say I want to whack Brent with a rock. So I'd use the mouse to aim at Brent, and then I'd hit the mouse button. Whack! I'd hit him with a rock. Uh, that's how you... And so let me tell you something. Not seamless. Not quick. This uh, combat. Uh, it's, a, it's a pain. Now, luckily, I played on the beginner level, because I give you three different difficulties. Oh, I didn't even... Yeah. I can't even imagine what would intermediate advance would be, because <laughs> beginner's brutal. Uh, you can also get uh, a shield at one point. Yes. Uh, if you uh, if you are very very good at it, uh, but uh, God, I couldn't do it. Uh, so the digitized sound we talked about, the annoying sound. They, believe it or not, they used a voice actor for this. <laughs> and this guy, yeah, they used a Dick Knoll, uh, who actually apparently was a guy who had done some stuff. And so, and some of the voices, some of the uh, digital sounds pretty good. Like when your guy falls, your guy can fall a little way, and he just gets dizzy, and he goes like, "Ooh, that's okay." Yeah. And the graphic interpretation is pretty is pretty good. Uh, you know, I always thought that was cool. Um, the uh, the game overall, though, let's talk. Let's get down to brass tacks here. Okay. This is a hard game, and when I say hard, I mean rock hard. Uh, I had it took everything I could to get past some of these screens. Uh, it, they were brutally difficult. Did, uh, did you get anywhere in this game? Nope. Did you get off the first level? 
well... I mean, did you get off you the can, first screen you went to? At that oh, point? yes. Yes, okay. I did get that. Yes. That took me hours. <laughs> to wow. get off. I had to watch people and figure out what the hell was going on. It's the controls, man. We yeah. are pampered uh, suckers these days. So you got the joystick. There's no joystick support in this game. There ain't no joystick. I didn't set up a joystick. I played an no, old school. Yeah, you had to play it like it was meant to be. And, and as close this as sucker is hardcore tough. I found the aiming to be okay with the mouse. It was okay. But it was still tough, man. Uh, uh, it was incredibly difficult to time leaps. Having to duck barrels and jump barrels, really tough. Uh, this is a one-hit kills affair. Uh, there ain't no health bar. You you know, it's one and done, son, just like last week. And this makes you uh, paranoid. This is that old-school game fear that you used to get when you have no chances. Uh, they give you they give you some lives. Uh, it was never enough. It was never enough. And I could never I actually get to a point where I actually got any of the, of the fireball or the shield. Yeah, the I, I, didn't get, I, I got the key. I didn't get any of that stuff. I'll watch the playthrough and to, just to see um, how to what happened at the end and, and whatnot. And even the playthrough... Didn't beat it. I had to go to a, yeah. a second playthrough filmed by a guy who just took his camera and set it near his Mac. Yeah. And after a while, he beat the the Knights. The uh, last level, not to spoil it, but a newsflash, this game is old enough where I'm just going to lay it down. <clears throat> you go through a mile of rough road, basically. You, how you would get to this guy, just getting to him, you wanted to get him my eyes. There's a knight sitting in his throne, and you've got to go all around him and pull these pull these chains. And eventually, he's throwing coffee cups. He's, at yeah, you know, the whole is time. it coffee? I, I thought he was throwing booze. I, I can picture a guy drinking like a, a mead well, or something. It's, it's a white mug. To me, it looks like a coffee mug, just because it's it's the handle's the same size as the cup. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, it just. He grabs it, drinks out of it, and throws it at yeah, you. Yeah, it, it is funny. It. It's cute. Uh, and But, of course, there's all kinds of crap going on. But anyway, you go all the way around this thing. Eventually, when you pull that last chain, the platform he's on sort of tips over, and he falls down. He's got, and, he, and, then, and then eventually, you get to sit in the chair as they can come over and drop some chair. Now, there's a, there's a gimmick on this screen that's the dirt worst. All right. There's a bird or a gargoyle or something that flies across these screens occasionally, and, and it won't kill you. It grabs you, and it takes you to that damn dungeon. If you run this last screen, and you have to fight your way back, all the way back to this guy, it's not like a screen over, two screens. It's a bunch of freaking screens. you got to go all the way back through. I would jump off a cliff. I watched a guy play this, and he beat the knight. And as the knight was falling off, that bird came and got him and took him to the dungeon. I would have drop kicked that monitor right out the back of the of the wall. Horrible, horrible, uh, horrible thing. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this got ported to a ton of different computers and with mixed results. I didn't look at every port, but I looked at a few. I looked at the Genesis port. The Genesis port is widely is the is is regarded as the worst, and it's widely regarded as one of the worst Genesis games of all time. Wow. Yeah, well, now, you know what? I remember playing this on the Genesis. Really? I, I mean, just it's one of those things where you're just running through games. I, yeah, 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 yep. Yeah, uh, I also had a look at the Amiga version. Now, it's funny, being uh, Amiga Air, and you'd think I would be all up in this thing. Well, guess what? I, I never knew about it. So uh, I had a look at it, and I will say the ones I looked at, it looked... Very similar to the Mac version, except they'd colorized it. Now, there was some uh, debate as to whether this thing should be colorized, what the color should look like, etc. Uh, there, I'll have to say, uh, I'm going to be that guy. I like it monochrome, to be honest with you. And there was no version I saw that was as sharp or as as uh, well done as the Mac version. It is absolutely gorgeously it done. Is. Uh, the Mac one, and I, it's funny, I didn't know much about the Mac, and Boat showed me a game called, it was called Glider uh, one time, and it, I was like, well, I was impressed with how sharp it looked. And it, one thing, it's sort of almost like the Vectrix in a way, and not that it's Vector, but it's, it's very, very sharp. Uh, the resolution is very crisp, isn't it? And it gives it a, a, a very unique, uh, a, a unique look to it. Um, so, these guys, 
This game was a massive hit on the Mac. I mean, massive. They did very, very well with it. And so, of course, you know what that means. Uh, when you, when a game does well, it's, they're going to have to come up with a sequel. And they, and they, and they did come up with a sequel. Uh, so, the second one was called Beyond Dark Castle. It was released the next year. Uh, and then there were a multitude of signal, sequels that went on, you know, that were not done by these guys. These guys did the two. So... You would think Silicon Beach would be the game distributors to end all game distributors. Well, not necessarily true. So, uh, the, the, these both these games did great, all right? critically acclaimed and everything, and you're riding high. Well, uh, uh, Silicon Beach did more than just games. Uh, they and, and they only did three games. They did the, the two Dark Castle games, and they did the an original game in 85 called Airborne. It was a combat game. It's where these first guys picked up on some of this stuff. Um, so, despite the fact that they made all this money on these games, their bread and butter was making uh, graphical software. They did Super Paint, uh, Super Card, Digital Dark Room, and, and, these, and this stuff netted them a ton of money. Sure. Oh, of course. You know? Especially now, about, yeah. The uh, the funny thing about it is, uh, uh, the the fact that they, the, despite the fact that these, uh, I mean, all the Dark Castle series sold better than these, but the difference is, these application software where dark the Dark Castle games would sell for thirty bucks, these things sold like hundred and fifty bucks yeah. a pop. Yeah. So just the, they while they had higher sales numbers, they weren't actually making more money. Plus, they saw the writing on the wall. That that in the future you're going to need a team of guys to do these games. There two or three guys. Those days were coming to an end. Right. It was the era where a team, and so they decided to uh, uh, stop doing games and switch the game, the company to uh, software. Uh, and in February of '90, uh, Jackson sold the company to all these corporations. And get this, this is great. He sold it to the Aldous Corporation for the exact amount of money he needed to train for an international style rapid fire pistol shooting. And then in '93, he made the U.S. team. So that's, ah, good. That's he, awesome. He, he that's made awesome. the U.S. Olympic team in shooting. That was just that was what he, he. That's how he ended up going. That's awesome. So he got he used this company to effectively fulfill his Olympic dream that's to a certain awesome. degree. Um, so uh, all this was a, a huge company at the time. So that you know, so they did good. They you know they made their money. They got out. Um, so there were so many sequels. I'm not going to go into all of it. I'll just name a few. There's Color Dark Castle that was came out in '94. Of course, I mentioned uh, uh, Beyond Dark, uh, Dark Castle. There's Return to Dark Castle, uh, and and then there's uh, even a version for that you can play on the I think on the phones. There's a version. Uh, this game for me was a real mixed bag. Uh, there were parts I really liked, the graphics, I liked the uh, movement, I thought the levels looked solid. There were parts I absolutely hated, which were the controls and the, and the jarring sound. Uh, in the end, much like Brent, this is the kind of game of, it was a game of its time. Uh, I can see a, a scenario where you take this game and you do something about the control. And you got and you got something that I would find more palatable. Uh, the control in this is just brutal, and 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 the guys that played this uh, to success back in the day were probably studs. Again, we're talking about a time where you're a kid, you've got no other games, and you sit down and play this game until you until your fingers bleed, which we both have been there. And 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 it's I can see why it's beloved because it's so it was so far ahead of everything else. I mean, it holds up in a lot of ways beautifully graphically, uh, and. Uh, it's 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 a, a monumental achievement. Uh, the reviews for this game were, I mean, they were off the charts. People were calling this the best arc game they'd ever seen, the best home game, the computer game they'd ever seen. I mean, it won awards. Uh, it got sound and graphics awards. Uh, computer Gaming World called it the best arcade game I've seen for the Mac, and perhaps I've best I've ever seen on any microcomputer ever. Wow, you know. Uh, Byte compared it to to Load Runner. Uh, that said, the, said the there's nothing new about the basic concept, but the execution is impressive. So I mean, they were they got over. Uh, the, uh, people like the animation. 
Uh, Compute gave it high marks. Compute also raved about the Amiga version, which they gave high marks. Uh, To put this into perspective as we close this out, in 88... Uh, they had sold uh, they had sold up to 30,000 copies and they were selling thousands every month and so get this this is the this is the crazy thing so dark castle was on the uh, uh, Mac world list of top five best-selling Mac entertainment programs for 39 months Ooh. and dark and beyond dark castle was in the top uh, was it was in the top five 21 times. And including the final month that they put that chart out huh. in 93. 93? Yeah. So that's like impressive. six years. Super impressive. So that goes that goes to show you how that goes. So I tried to eBay this. Guess what? They're, for the Mac, I looked exclusive for the Mac version. Good luck. I couldn't find any. I did find someone selling the disc. 25 bucks just for the wow. disc. So this ain't going to be a cheap one uh, to come up with. But an interesting... An interesting couple of games. My issue with Dark Castle among... I I, I hated the controls. Uh, I hated the sound. If it wasn't... If they would just not made the mice so high-pitched and annoying. Yeah. Uh, but you know what really killed this game for me more than anything else? Yeah. The respawn on the enemy was too fast. Yeah, they came it back in a hurry. It was too fast. Yeah, I agree, I agree. And it made the game into something I don't think it should have been. <laughs> yeah. Which it was, it was all, it was almost trial and error. Because it was, okay, I need to hit this, hit this, and then how long can I get, how long before I have to stop and hit him again and kill him again? The exact same enemy. So you'd have to turn around and kill bats that are hanging out at the top of the screen like three or four times to get through a single screen. You're right. Um... You, this game, it, it, the the graphics were incredible. The animations were pretty good, but the static graphics were incredible. When I first loaded this up, I I, actually, I was like, you know, this reminds me a lot the the kind of the 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 big sprites for the characters and stuff reminded me of Prince of Persia. Yeah. Now the animation was nowhere near no. Prince of Persia level, but the graphics had that sort of big sprite feel that yes, I like. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree to 100%. But uh yeah, I, I, man, I wanted to like this game because this is sort of my style of game, the the platforming type, but the controls were just they were too hard for me. I I in my mind, maybe if you know, in a different setting, I I, I could sit down and and devote a few hours into getting the controls under my feet. I just couldn't do it this week. And again, Kind of like my game, I'm going to give this game not as much of a pass because I feel like I played the game in a way that it was meant to be played with the with the mouse and, and the movement, and I just couldn't grasp it. Maybe if I had more time, I, I could get somewhere with it, but I, I wasn't a big fan of this one either. Well, we're going to move on to something I also have mixed feelings about and also have no control over. Hit the music. Yes. Oh. What do we got new this week, Brinster? The 32X, I believe? The 32X. Yes. So, uh, we have had a weird bunch of uh, weeks, and they keep getting weird. We've got a lot of strange, strange stuff up here, Brent. Boy, so, I would, uh, I'd be pretty happy if we got some dolls. <laughs> spin the wheel and make the deal, sir. No, I'm going to spin it this way this week. Are we different. supposed to spin it the other way? Does that make it work better? I guess it does. Let's see what we get here. Survey says. Oh, thank you. What do we get? We got DOS. We got DOS. <laughs> MS DOS. One of the longest tenured spokes on the wheel. Yes. Now, Brent, what do you think about MS DOS? You probably used this for a while. Oh, man. I'll tell you, I think it's very fitting that we are going from uh, Macintosh to DOS. And I, I think that. Um, I think next week will be a very special week indeed. Very good, very good. So, uh, tune in next week as we explore the gaming realms of MS-DOS. And, Brent, uh, I think that's it. Yep. Until next week, Mac on!